Welcome to Empowered Learning. This is the second video in the video series for applications of exponential and logarithmic functions. So in this video, what we are going to focus on are examples where we use exponential and logarithmic functions to model um, such things such as exponential growth and decay um, in, for instance, population growth, um, radioactive substance decay. Uh, we're going to look at um, some examples where we are measuring decibel levels uh, for sound intensity. And of course, that's characterized by uh, logarithmic functions. Uh, we're going to look at some examples for um, trying to figure out how intense an earthquake is by the Richter scale. And uh, we'll learn a little bit about that as well. Uh, we'll also look and see how uh, we can actually apply exponential functions to um, doing calculations for atmospheric pressure as well. So um, we're going to start off here by just going over some basic formulas um, that we use to model certain situations. And um, how this video will be crafted is I'll introduce some formulas, then we'll do some examples, and then I'll go on to the next topic and introduce that. So it'll be sort of a going back and forth um, instead of trying to introduce everything all at once and then trying to do a bunch of examples at the end. So uh, we want to start off here with what our basic um, exponential growth or exponential decay formula is. And as you can see here, um, it is simply just um, a is equal to a naught or a sub zero, which is just going to be the initial value of whatever it is that we're talking about, times e. And if you remember, e is that irrational number that's approximately equal to 2.713. And um, r is going to be the growth rate and t is going to be the time. So um, when we talk about the growth rate, and I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on that, uh, for instance, if we say a population grows by um, 1% per year, okay, then what we're saying is, is that um, whatever that population was a year later, um, we added on an extra percent of that. Okay, So now that's 1.1%. If we go on in year two and the population growth is still the same, then we're doing 1% of 1.1%. And of course, 1% of 1.1% will be another 0.11% added on to it. And so now um, you have 1.21% um, of the population now um, in, in the next round. So my point is that anytime uh, we say that something grows at a certain percentage rate, that automatically lets us know that it's that the growth is going to be exponential. Okay. All right, so uh, with that being said, we know that um, a sub, a, uh, sub zero, or a naught, is going to be the initial value. Um, we're going to express our growth rate in decimal form. Um, of course, time is time, and depending upon the, the problem, we'll know whether it's in years, seconds, you know, whatever. And of course, a is the actual new amount of the growth or decay. Now, one of the things that we want to note for this general formula here, and I'm going to rewrite it just so that everything is clear, it matters uh, whether the growth rate is assumed to be positive or negative. So whenever our growth rate is positive, then we are assuming exponential growth occurs. But if R is negative, uh, meaning that it's less than zero, then we know that exponential decay occurs. Okay? And so we know that exponential growth and decay formula can, um, is used to measure and calculate such things as, of course, population growth or decay, uh, radioactive decay, um, and log logarithmic scales or applications of logarithmic scales such as um, the Richter scale, decibel scales as well. Um, we'll also see that uh, we also use uh, exponentials and logarithms uh, for things like the pH scale as well, uh, being able to uh, measure the pH balance or the, the amount of hydronium ions in a particular substance as well. Okay, so we'll, we'll see that. So, of course, our population growth formula um, would just 
augmented what we had. Instead of saying A, we have P as our variable, and we know here that our growth rate is going to be positive. Okay, For radioactive decay, kind of the same thing, but uh, we switch the variable from P to D to represent decay, and of course, our growth rate will be negative in that instance. Okay, But everything else pretty much the same. Um, I don't have any actual examples on the pH scale in this particular video, but um, I do want to at least show you the formula and talk about it a bit. And so here um, we can see that the relationship in between uh, the number of hydronium ions uh, that we have in a particular substance and what we call this pH level um, is essentially a negative times log base 10 of the number of hydronium ions. And of course, if we express that exponentially, that looks this way. And how we're able to switch this from um, being, in, being in a logarithmic form to an exponential form is just by using the definition of a logarithm, which basically says that hey, if I have a logarithmic equation, its corresponding um, exponential equation that has the same equivalent information in it, just arranged in a different way, um, is going to be a raised to the y is equal to x. And so um, in this instance, if we were trying to apply that here, then what this would look like is that since the base, and I'm going to use a different color here just to kind of get some separation. All right, so whoops, so we're going to go here. So the base is going to be the same thing as A. Whatever the logarithm equals, that is what Y is going to be because we know um, that the exponent for an exponential ex expression is nothing more, um, just, well, well, I'll say it like this. A logarithm is a fancy way of expressing the exponent of an exponential function. So you see the same Y that's right here is the same one that's right there. And of course, what's inside the logarithm is what is considered to be X here. All right. And so we see here that pH is just a scale to measure how acidic or basic something is. And um, this H with the plus in the exponent is just our um, hydronium ion concentration or hydrogen um, ion concentration of a substance. And of course, it's measured in moles per liter. And I'm calling them hydronium ions because Hydrogen ion pretty much is that, uh, at least as far as I know. Um, for you science people out there, if I'm wrong, please let me know. All right, so uh, let's move on. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about the pH scale since um, I don't really have um, examples I'm going to work here. Um, we know that the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. And of course, uh, pH of 0 means that it's very acidic, like battery acid, 14 is liquid um, drain cleaner, or I like to say liquid draino. So we know that those are on the extremes. And of course, pure water um, is right in the middle. And uh, you see that a lot of the stuff that uh, we uh, could ingest or eat or, or allow ourselves to get into, such as um, a lake, rain, eating a banana, um, of course, drinking pure water itself, milk, um, consuming baking soda, um, you know, of course, if you're baking something or whatnot, eggs, all those things uh, are kind of centered around to where it's not too far away from uh, the pH level of seven. Now, of course, we also consume orange juice or soda, but one of the things that um, we know is that we shouldn't consume too much orange juice, con shouldn't consume too much soda. And of course, with lemon juice, I don't know anyone who consumes a whole lot of that. Um, even though, you know, it could be good, but the thing is the fact that it's really sick, if you consume too much of that, of course, it starts to affect the health of your body. Uh, kind of the same thing on, on the other front, um, you wouldn't want to drink bleach, okay? Not going to be very good if you do that. Um, I know some people got the idea of that um, over the past couple of years. I don't know why, but not a good idea. <laughs> so um, anyway. So we kind of see what the um, what the pH scale is like. And of course, seven is right in the middle. 
And of course, for humans, um, we would want to consume um, as many products that had something close to a pH level of seven as possible, because that's going to agree well with our bodies. Since um, about 70 to 80 percent of a human's body itself is made out of water. Okay. All right. So let's uh, move on and actually do some examples now. OK, so for our first example, we want to concentrate on population growth. And we see that a particular population of people in a small town initially had a population of 2000 people. Um, if this population of people had an annual growth rate of 1.3 percent um, in a 20 year period, we want to find the following things. So first, we want to find the time that it takes for this population of people to double in size. Um, that is to say, the time that it takes to grow from 2,000 to 4,000 people, and we know this as the doubling time. So for this example, I'm actually going to do it two different ways. Uh, the first way I'm going to do it is the traditional way, um, just kind of going through the equations blindly. But then I'm going to introduce a shortcut for us that we can actually use anytime we're faced with um, trying to figure out how long uh, something's going to take to double, and we actually have... Uh, the annual growth rate available to us. Okay, so here, if we start off, we know that we should have p is equal to p not e raised to the r t, and so we know this 1.3 percent. That's what's going to be our r. We know 20 here is going to be our time, and we know that the initial amount of people is going to be um, 2,000. And of course, uh, that same here, we know that the final amount over the 20 year period uh, sh should be uh, 4,000, okay? So, well, I really shouldn't assume that that's gonna be over 20 year period. We just know in a 20 year period, they had this growth rate of 1.3%. And we're assuming that if it ends up being that um, we are, we're trying to figure out how long it's going to take for us to grow from 2000 to 4000. So we have all this information. The one thing that we don't know is the time. OK, so if we plug all of this in, we know that we will have 4000 equals 2000 E raised to the R, which is going to be the point zero one three times t. And so from here, of course, the first thing that we would want to do uh, to make life easy for ourselves is just divide both sides by 2000. Okay. And if we did that, of course, um, on the left hand side, we would just get two. On the right hand side, we would get e raised to the 0 0.013 t. And so um, at this point, um, we could either directly use the definition of a logarithm to, to change this from an exponential to a logarithmic expression, or uh, we can do what I'm going to do here, which is take the natural log of both sides. And um, I could do log base 10 of both sides, log base 8 of both sides, but I'm choosing natural log of both sides because of the fact that um, I know natural log of X is the same thing as log base E. And of course that matches my X, my, the base of the exponential expression E raised to the point 013 T. And that's going to help me to be able to simplify things. Okay. So once we have that, then, of course, um, here we know that this right hand side, uh, natural log of E raised to the point 0, 1, 3 T per our logarithm rules, all of this is just going to be 0, 0.103 T. So because of that, now we're just going to say, therefore, natural log of 2 is equal to 0 0.013 t and here we end up dividing both sides of our equation here 
by the growth rate Clean that up here. So we do that by the growth rate, and what we see we have here is essentially natural log of two divided by point um, zero one three. And so here, if we went ahead and uh, we got that answer here. We should get roughly a, a little over 53 years. So I'm going to give you what the actual answer is and then show you here why we should just answer it as 53 years. So when I put this into my calculator, I got 53.319031389. Uh, okay. And of course, that's years. And for simplicity, uh, we want to say, well, that's roughly going to be about 53.3 years. Okay. Now, um, what I want to focus on here is this portion of a problem notice here that we did all this work and then we got down and it was literally just natural log of two divided by what our original growth rate was okay and so it turns out that anytime we do a problem where we are trying to uh, double um, find a, a doubling time and we are using a model uh, like what we have here, uh, the P equals P sub zero times E raised to the RT, we're always going to end up with this situation of having natural log of two over whatever the growth rate is. And so um, in general, we wanna generalize that so that whenever we see these kind of problems, uh, we really don't wanna have to go through all this extra work here. Um, we can just kind of cut to the chase and, and get to what we need to. So um, now I'm going to show you a way that we can generalize that and make it simple. Um, and this will work for not only doubling time, but if we're doing halving time, uh, sometimes we call it half-life. Whenever we're doing, um, let's say, archaeological carbon dating, um, we could also extend the idea and apply it to if we're trying to figure out um, when, when, when the time is going to be quadruple, um, when we want to cut time by a third instead of a half. Uh, we, we could do all of that. And so I'm um, going to talk about that next. So in general here, you see that we have a direct relationship in between uh, the growth rate, in this case of a population, and uh, the doubling time of half-life. And so our growth rate, of course, is R. Doubling time, we're calling it capital T sub DBL. And we see here that this equation sort of embodies that relationship. And then the problem that we were doing, this is what we ended up with, okay? And of course, um, in this case, we're assuming R is positive. So if we look at it in terms of um, decay rate, uh, meaning that this value of R is now negative, uh, then of course, we'll be talking about half-life, okay? And so our half time, if you want to call it that. And so this lets us know, um, in general, um, if we're talking about maybe a substance, um, what what is going to be the amount of time that elapses before uh, half of a substance sort of, you know, just deteriorates or, or decays. And so here, kind of the same thing. We see that we have this general relationship here. Um, and of course, the one thing that's constant there is the natural log of two. However, um, here is, is not showing here, so I'm going to go ahead and write it in. Uh, this should be a minus sign here, okay? And um, I didn't write it here only because if I leave it off, if I leave it off here, then what we're assuming here is that, of course, 
um, we've kind of stripped out the whole point of R being negative at that point. Okay. So, but in general, I should have a negative here so that when I divide this um, by R, or let's say in this case, we know that R itself would be negative. And of course, a, a negative divided by a negative would be a positive, And that would kind of make sense for us. Okay. So here also understand that where this actually came from, um, if, we, if I wanted to write it this way, I could say R times T is equal to natural log of, and I'm just going to say M, where M is going to be the, the, the amount that we want to double or you know decrease of whatever that we're talking about. So let's say M was one half, okay? Well, in this case, I could say R times T is equal to natural log of one half. And note that because of my logarithm properties, I could rewrite the right hand side as natural log of one minus natural log of two and natural log of one is just zero. So what I would still end up with here is just R times T minus natural log of two. Okay, so that's where that comes from. But in general, um, let's say if I wanted to figure out, um, you know, when is a, a third of a, a particular substance going to go away or when is a third of the population going to go away if people are moving, then, of course, at that point, instead of M being one half, I can say let M be one third and we can kind of accomplish the same thing. And in this instance, what we will end up with is um, we would end up with ne negative natural log of three instead of just negative natural log of two. Okay? Um, if we wanted to extend that even further, let's say we wanted to figure out when two thirds of a population or substance decays, then in this case, um, we would end up having a natural log of two thirds in the numerator, which we could rewrite as natural log of two minus natural log of three. Okay. So it just all depends upon what you want. So with that, we'll go back to our example here and finish it up. All right. So for the part B portion of our example here, um, we want to know well, what will be the approximate population in the year 2030, assuming that this population had uh, the initial size of 2000 in the year 2012. Okay. So uh, the first thing that we want to note here is that everything is relative to when we begin. So of course we had 2000 people in the year 2012. So that's when everything starts. So the actual time is going to be the difference in between when we want to end versus when we started. And of course, uh, that's going to be 18 years, okay? Now, for everything else, of course, our initial population is going to be uh, 2,000, and we're gonna keep that growth rate the same. And so with that, all we need to do now is just say that the new population is just going to be 2,000, e raised to 0 0.013, multiply that times 18, and that result, um, if we put it into a calculator, will be 2,527.288984, which roughly rounds into 2,518 people, okay? And so we see that in, in an 18-year period at the 1.3% um, growth rate that we will have um, an extra 528 people. Okay, so for our next example, uh, we're going to do one where we are trying to track uh, radioactive decay. And so the problem says the half-life of 
the radioactive element on unobtainium of 41 is 20 seconds. And if 17.2% of this particular uh, radioactive element is present at a particular point in time, what length of time has elapsed? Okay. So in looking at this problem, we know that, let's say the initial amount, we're going to call it d sub zero, um, is going to be something, right? But we know that 20 seconds later, here, let me, so we got 20 seconds later, we know that the amount here is going to be 17.2% of what we had before. So if we express that, that's just going to be 0.172 of what we originally had. So we don't we don't know what the original amount is, but we do know that we have only 17.2% of it left um, after 20 seconds. Okay. And so what we are trying to figure out is how much time has passed since then. Well, if we look at our formula that we use to model this situation here, then we notice that what we have information on is we have a time to equal 20 seconds. Uh, we have um, we don't have an initial amount, but that's not something that we really need to know. We do have a final amount. And we're told here that the half life is 20 seconds. So this is actually not just time, but it is the um, half life. So not double time, half life. So the reason why this is important is because remember here that the growth rate times t whenever we have half-life is minus natural log of 2. So here if I have the time, and I'm going to Uh, just going to erase it and call it that. So if I have the time, which is really the half-life that we're talking about here, then I could figure out what the growth rate is. Okay. So we have this information, this, this, this. And so this tells me here that the growth rate here is going to be minus natural log of 2 over the time, and this is going to be the half-life here. And of course, this is just going to be the 20 seconds. So we're just going to put 20 there. And so here we're going to assume everything is measured in seconds. So now that we have this particular situation here, we pretty much got uh, most of what we need to figure out what we want. So if we go ahead and plug it in, and I'm going to do this in a different color here. So therefore, we know that the final amount is going to be 0.172 of the initial equals the initial amount e raised to. And so here I've put the, the minus here just to signify that um, what we actually had going on is radioactive decay. In actuality, uh, to kind of make this work sign-wise, um, what I could do here is get rid of the negative sign. And here we'll just say, all right, we know that R is negative. So if we look at it that way, then here this is going to be E raised to and then we're going to have a minus um, natural log of 20. Sorry, natural log of 2 divided by 20. And let me fix one. 
just trying to start over. So minus natural log of two over 20. And that's what R is. And then we're going to multiply that times T, all in the exponent there, okay? And so to make this look uh, the way that it needs to here in order for us to figure out what we need to do nice and clean, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rewrite this right hand side, okay? And so notice here that one thing that I could do is I could rewrite the right hand side this way. Okay. Now, the reason I can do that, and I'm going to scroll down a bit to uh, try to explain how I can rewrite that, is notice here that negative natural log of 2 is the same as natural log of 2 raised to the negative 1, which is the same as natural log of 1 half. Okay. And so using our logarithm properties, uh, we can write that. The other thing that you want to notice here is that what I've done now that I have rewritten negative natural log of two as natural log raised to the positive one half, I have a situation here where I have this. All that over 20 T. And if I use the exponential rule, a raised to the m, all that raised to the n, I know that I can multiply my exponents. And so right now, what I have is e, which is in the place of a, raised to the product of two things. m is represented by this um, natural log of 1 half divided by 20, and n could be represented by t. So what I could do to rewrite this is just put the parenthesis here like that, okay? And um, here I can decide to let t divided by 20 be the thing that's on the, um, the outside exponent instead of um, the natural log of 1 half divided by 20, okay? So if I do that, I'll erase all of that. Then, of course, what we end up having is this divided by 20 here and the natural log of one half there. And so that's why I can rewrite it this way. OK, now the reason I want to rewrite it this way is because I know that E raised to the natural log of one half, that's just another way of saying one half. Okay. And we know that because of another logarithmic property here. And I'm going to erase what I have here and actually show that as well. So recall here that anytime we have a raised to the log base a of x, our logarithm properties tell us that that's just equal to x. So basically what is whatever is inside the logarithm here, where this logarithm is in the exponent, that's what that this simplifies to. And so here, if I say e raised to the log base e of x, that is also x. But notice that log base e is just the long way of saying the natural law. So here, if I replace all of that with just e raised to the natural log of x, notice that that's pretty much what I have inside of these uh, grouping symbol brackets here, okay? Where x is just one half. So if x is one half here, then x has to be um, one half there, okay? And so that's how I end up getting that. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we knew the relationship in between 
the growth rate, and in this case, the half-life. Um, wanted to make sure that we characterize that properly so that we can end up with this particular equation. So now you're going to see, because we know this, when we solve this particular equation for time, it's going to be a whole lot cleaner than what it would be um, if we were trying to write a whole bunch of decimal numbers and all that. So what this turns out to be now is point 172 times the initial amount d sub 0 equals d sub 0 1 half raised to the t over 20. Okay. And here, if we divide both sides by d sub 0, then we just get one, uh, 0.172 equals 1 half raised to the t over 20. Okay. And so now at this point, uh, we have a few choices on how we can go about getting the answer. Um, what I'm going to do here is essentially just take the natural log of both sides. That's probably the, the easiest, most straightforward way to do this. And if I do that, then this right hand side, because of our logarithm properties again, we know that we can take this t divided by 20 here and we can pull it out in front. Okay. So here, this is going to be t divided by 20 times natural log of 1 half. And so at this point, if we uh, keep going here, what I can do is um, multiply both sides of this equation. So this side and this side, if I multiply both sides of the equation by 20, then that's going to get rid of the 20 in the denominator here, but it's going to put a 20 times this number here. So that's what we're going to write next. So let's say 20 times natural log of 0.172. And that is going to be just T times natural log of 1 half. And so now um, we are where we really want to be here because we just need to get T by itself. And so to get, to get T by itself here, all we need to do is divide both sides by natural log of one half. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's try to write that one half again. My pen got stuck. So natural log of one half here. And of course, it's natural log of one half, natural log of one half reduces to one. And uh, we'll write this in a different color. Therefore, now what we have is on the left hand side, we have 20 times natural log of 0 0.172. Notice that because of our logarithm properties again, I can take this 20 and I can put it back in the exponent here. So I'm going to rewrite this as natural log of 0.172 that raised to the 20. And that's going to be that divided by and I'm going to get rid of this stray mark here. And that's going to be divided by natural log of one half. And um, we know that natural log of one half is just the same as negative natural log of two. Okay. So we had actually went over that earlier. So I'm just rewriting that. And this is equal to T. And so now if you were to um, you know, put this in your calculator, whether you want to put 
uh, natural log of one half or you want to put um, negative natural log of two if you type this into your calculator uh, here what you should be getting is going to be of uh, something close to 50 yeah so yeah okay so I, I went ahead and I calculated it and the actual number here is going to be 50 point seven nine zero three nine zero six uh, which which we can just basically say here that's going to be about uh, 50.8 seconds okay so here we're just going to round and say 50.8 seconds and so that is for that particular uh, element to have only 17.2 percent of it left we know that it was um, I guess being exposed to whatever for uh, 50.8 seconds so a little less than a minute all right so let's move on to our next example so before we get into our next set of examples um, we need to go over some more formulas here and so the the next I want to say three or four examples that we're going to do involves problems that deal with the decibel scale and uh, the Richter scale. So uh, the decibel scale is um, famous for being a, a way for us to be able to measure uh, sound intensity. Um, of course, we measure other things with it, but uh, probably the, the most common thing is going to be uh, sound intensity. And so uh, we sort of characterize the ratio of uh, the softest sound that can be detected by the um, intensity of the actual sound that we are um, hearing, recording, or perceiving. And we use that logarithmically uh, to try to figure out um, what its, its dB level or how intense the sound is. So if you can see, we have the dB level, as we call it. Um, and a decibel is actually a tenth of a bell. So a bell is an actual uh, an actual quantity. And of course, a decibel is just a tenth of that because a bell is so big. OK, so. Here we say that a decibel can be calculated um, and this is power wise by day by saying 10 times um, log of the ratio of I divided by I sub zero where I is the intensity of the actual sound being measured, and I sub zero is going to be the smallest audible sound. And so uh, just for uh, to keep everything nice and simple, I've given a figure for that, which is like one times 10 to the negative 16 uh, watt per square centimeter. So we're gonna use that in our examples here. So um, here on the, the, the next page that we have here, I'm going to show you a uh, a, a picture of the of the different things that could produce a particular sound intensity level okay so but the the main thing here I want you to realize is that we're characterizing the the sound intensity of a particular sound um, in terms of uh, the exponent of how many times um, louder or more intense than it is from the softest sound. Now to see that if I was to rearrange this particular equation here and actually write it in exponential form, what it would look like is this. You have dB divided by 10 and this would be uh, yeah, so I'll just do it like this first. Yeah kind of take you through it all. So this is what this would be. And then since this is log base 10, um, I could raise this to the 10 here, do that to the 10. And so what I would end up having right here is just 10 raised to the dB divided by 10. And here this 10 raised to the log base 10 of i divided by i sub zero would just be i divided by i sub zero and so this is what it looks like in exponential terms 
And so notice here that the ratio of this, we are essentially saying that, hey, uh, whatever this ends up being, and this is in terms of power, so that's why you have a 10 there. Um, if it was in terms of something else, like for electrical engineers, if we had a voltage or current, then we would have a 20 there. And because of the power relationship in between you know, power and voltage and current, that's why uh, the numbers are different. But here, whatever this exponent is, we know that um, if we take it and and we multiply times 10, that is what the actual decibel would be. OK, so you see it in exponential form. You see it here in logarithmic form. All right. So uh, with the Richter scale, we see here that, again, the the intensity of an earthquake, which we're going to uh, call M if it's measured on the Richter scale, is going to be log of the ratio of A, which is the amplitude of uh, the peak amplitude measure on a seismograph, divided by A sub zero, which is going to be the amplitude of what I'm calling a standard earthquake. And what I mean by that is that um, the tectonic plates um, that are under the earth are always shifting. OK. So there is there is always a certain level of um, intensity of tectonic plates moving. It's just that when that intensity gets to be very, very much out of whack, um, that's why we use the Richter scale to kind of measure that. OK, now we also see here that because we have log of something divided by something else, we can use our logarithm properties and rewrite it as the difference of logarithms as well where we have log of a minus log of a sub zero. Now, uh, just like how we did before, um, if I was to write this in exponential form, this would look like 10 raised to the m is equal to a divided by a naught or a sub zero. Okay. And um, here you see again, the Richter scale is just um, an exponent kind of describing the um, how much more intense the tectonic plate shifts are sort of interacting with each other uh, versus what it normally is when you know not much is going on or when we can't feel much. OK, now this a sub zero figure here, um, depending upon where a uh, where a sensor for a seismograph is placed um that's going to determine what that number is and so to keep the problem simple for us here uh, we're going to use two figures so um, if we know that uh, we're going to use log base 10 of a sub zero is going to be a negative 1.7 and that's going to define the measurement for a standard earthquake uh, where our seismograph is going to be located 20 kilometers from the epicenter or point of origin of the earthquake. OK, um, if it's further away at 300 kilometers, then this particular number for log base 10 of a sub zero is going to be a little bit more negative at negative four. OK, now, um, again, based upon um, where a, a seismograph sensor is placed and how far you know, it actually is from where the actual earthquake is, this number can change. But to, again, to keep the problems real simple here, we're either going to go with the 20 kilometers from the epicenter or 300 kilometers from the epicenter. So I wanted to show this slide that I got from um, one of the, the Pearson textbooks um, I've, I've taught in before to kind of give you an idea of what a certain decibel level is like. So we see down here at the bottom um, an inaudible sound um, is minus uh, 10 decibels. And the softest one is when, of course, the decibel level is zero. And that would uh, as many times as loud as the softest audible sound. Well, that's just one. And so notice that this is all just um, a ratio or saying how many times louder is this particular sound versus the softest. OK, so if we hear the rustle of leaves, that's going to be about um, you know, 10 times louder than this sound here. Um, of course, uh, if we're talking about 10,000 times uh, louder, that's going to be the background uh, noise of an average home. Um, a busy street, you know, is going to be about 
a million, a million times, sorry, a hundred million times. And um, this is going to be a billion times here, the 10 raised to the nine. And so uh, the threshold of pain. And so that's when, of course, let's say if you're at a, a concert or you're listening to music real loud, um, you really start to notice, um, <laughs> you know, let's say you turn it off and your ears start ringing. So at about 90 dBs, that's what you would would start to notice there. Um, of course, at 100 uh, dBs, which is about, um, let's say about 10 billion times louder th than the softer sound here, then that's like a siren 30 meters away from you. And of course, if you were standing close to a jet that's been fired up, it's got all its engines on, um, <laughs> about 30 meters away from you, then this is, is about, that's about 140 decibels. Okay. So as you can see, quite loud. So we also talked about the Richter scale as well. So I wanted to show a few graphics on that. And so for most of us, we know that the Richter scale normally goes from about um, a one to 10. Uh, this particular graphic uh, just says nine or greater. And so in short, um, if most of you have experienced an earthquake or have been through one, um, you know anything that's probably below 4.0 on the Richter scale, you're probably not gonna notice much. Um, at about 4.0 on the Richter scale, you start to, you know, feel some rumblings. Um, but again, nothing's really damaged. And of course, it just kind of goes on from there. So uh, we know that I know that there was an earthquake in San Francisco, I want to say during a baseball game back in 1989. And that one was about 8.9, 9.0 on the Richter scale. So you can see um, that that one, you know, was was pretty bad. Uh, but not the worst that it could get. And of course, there's you know been others that's been um, you know very close to the 10.0 on the Richter scale uh, kind of range. And of course, here I got a few other graphics for you uh, that I've got from some places on the internet. And so this kind of gives you an idea of of what goes on here. So of course, at 2.0, um, you know not much going on. You may have like a little you know flower pot sway a little bit. Um, at 3.0, so weighs a little bit more. At 4.0, uh, you have some rumbling. It may drop. Uh, but of course, starting at, you know, 5.0 on the Richter scale and above, things start to happen, you know, to your whole house and not just the desk. And of course, uh, once you reach about uh, 8.0 on the Richter scale, you, <laughs> you're like, okay, this is not good. And of course, at 10, you know, everything is just, you know, destroyed. Okay. And uh, this is just another picture here, kind of the same thing. Um, again, at 2.0, not much. Um, you may see your water vibrate a bit. Uh, 3.0, some light swing. But of course, once you get to about you know 5.0, 6.0, uh, you start to see some some real expensive damage. And of course, anything that's 9.0 or greater, um, it's pretty much. <laughs> going to be a lot of damage at that point. All right, so let's uh, get back to doing uh, some more examples here. So for the next two examples, we're going to be doing uh, examples about the decibel scale. So here we want to find the number of decibels uh, for the power of um, the sound of a rock concert. And of course, we measured it and it measured at 7.32 times 10 to the negative 6 watt per square centimeter and again we're using the reference that the that the softest audible sound that we have is one times ten raised to the negative sixteen so here we know that of course if we're measuring db levels for power and notice that the word power was there um, we know that this is going to be just ten times log of I divided by I sub zero. And here, this is 7.32 times 10 raised to the negative six over one times 10 raised to the negative 16. And here, if we were to uh, keep on going here, do a little simplification. You know, this is 10 times log base 10 of, and this will be 
times 10 raised to the minus 6 minus a negative 16. So I'm using my exponential rules here. And of course, that would mean that this would become a plus. And this would be 10 times log base 10 of 7.32 times 10 raised to the power of 10. Okay. And so, um, of course, from here, um, we could just calculate it directly. And um, if we did that, what we would get here is roughly about 108.6451108. So uh, we'll just say in general, uh, this dB level would be about 108.65 dB. Okay. So if we go back to our table here, we see that about 108.65 is somewhere in between here. So um, it's louder than a siren, but we're not quite at the point to where um, we can actually damage your ears. So it's loud, but it's, it's not loud to the point to where um, you're damaging your ears with exposure to that sound for just a little bit of time. All right, let's move to our next example. So in this next example, we have um, an Airbus airplane and it's 30 meters away from uh, where we're measuring and it has a decibel level of 138 dBs. We wanna find the actual intensity of the sound I measured in watts per square centimeter, okay? So here, if you remember, this was our formula for calculating dBs, but remember what we want is the actual intensity here. So if you remembered, I had rearranged this equation here by dividing by 10. And then afterwards, um, using logarithmic properties, well actually exponential properties in this case, um, and this is the one that basically says, if I have two things that are equal to each other, then that also means if I was to form an exponential equation out of it uh, by making the u and the v exponents, then what is on the left, exponential expression should be equal to what's on the right. So if I do that, then I would essentially have what you're looking at here. And of course, the right-hand side of all of this just ends up equaling I divided by I sub zero, okay? And so I'm going through all this because what we really need to find out is what I is. So if we find out what I is, all I have to do is multiply both sides of this equation by I sub zero to be able to do that. So if I have I sub zero times 10 raised to the dB divided by 10, that is what I is going to be. And that's what we need to use. So we see I here is going to be I sub zero times 10 raised to the dB divided by 10. Our I sub zero, we already know, that's going to be one times 10 raised to the negative 16, and that's going to be in watts per square centimeter. I'm going to have that times 10 raised to the 138 divided by 10. Okay. And so this is basically 1 times 10 raised to the negative 16 times 10 raised to the 13 point 8. So if we figure out what that is here, if we multiply that 1 times 10 raised to the negative 16 times 10 raised to the 13.8, then what we will have is a 0 0.00630957345. 
and this is in watt per square centimeter. And we could simply simplify that to 6 times 3.1 times 10 raised to the 3 watt per square centimeter. Okay. And that is what the actual intensity level as, um, as measured would be. All right, so let's uh, move on and do some uh, Richter scale problems now. All right, so for our first Richter scale problem here, um, we have a seismograph uh, that's 300 kilometers from the epicenter um, of an earthquake, and it recorded a maximum amplitude of 6.5 times 10 raised to the two micrometers. And so what we want to first find out is uh, the, the earthquake's magnitude on a Richter scale, okay? So basically we want to find out what M is. This is the formula that we could use to do that. Um, the one thing that we have to know here is, uh, since we were kind of given some information about what log of the um, initial amplitude would be depending upon how far it was, we have to think about um, what were we given whenever we said um, the seismograph was 300 kilometers away. And so here we were told that this value here was a negative four, okay? So we're just gonna say M is equal to log base 10 of A minus log base 10 of A sub zero. And we know here that this is just going to be a negative four. And here we know that A is going to be this. So if we write all that in, see we have log base 10 of 6.5 times 10 raised to the two, and we'll just leave the units off, minus a negative four, which will basically be the same as plus four. And if we were to type that all into um, a calculator, get the answer, um, we would get 6.8129133357, okay? And of course, uh, this is, uh, we don't really put a unit on it. We just say that is this amount on the Richter scale. And here we normally don't go above, uh, go past the first decimal place. So here this would be 6.8 on uh, the Richter scale. And that would be sort of a, a way for us to kind of gauge, um, you know, how violent the earthquake was, okay? Now for our second problem, let's assume here that the, the amplitude or the max amplitude um, that's read on the seismograph is still the same, so it's still 6.5 times 10 to the 2 micrometers, but now the seismograph sensor was only 20 kilometers away from the epicenter. So what is going to be uh, the, the rating per the Richter scale now? So here, again, we would use the same thinking here, but this time remember that when it was only 20 kilometers away, this value here was a negative 1.7. So now that we have that, then of course, this log of A, which is 6.5 times 10 raised to the two, minus a negative 1.7, that's the same as addition. And so um, if we put that in our calculators, we'll get something like 4.5129133357, which is roughly 4.5 on the Richter scale. So we see that if the epicenter of the earthquake um, was closer to the actual seismograph uh, sensor, then of course the, the rating would be lower. 
if the the max amplitude measure on the seismograph was the same okay all right so the very last example that i'm going to do for you all here is going to be about calculating atmospheric pressure and uh, what i wanted to do here is just quickly kind of give you um, you know i got this off the, the internet as well and uh, just kind of give you an idea of what all goes into uh, calculating um, atmospheric pressure. Um, the one of the main things I want you to realize here is that um, atmospheric pressure is measured based off of a reference pressure here. And normally uh, we'll say that um, we'll use the atmospheric pressure at sea level uh, to kind of give us a frame of reference. Here. And so, of course, the atmospheric pressure here um, is going to be per some height and altitude. And notice that because we have this negative um, exponent there, that atmospheric pressure is decreasing the higher we go up. Okay, And so that's uh, one of the main things I wanted you to see there. And of course, we have you know all these things like Avogadro's number and Boltzmann's constant, or whatnot that you normally see in a you know regular physics class or whatnot. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to know um, <laughs> right off the top of my head what all this stuff is. Um, I do know that m is mass and g is gravity and h is height. Uh, but we use all that to be able to essentially calculate the atmospheric pressure. Okay. And so, um, let me go ahead and scroll down here. So this is uh, the website that I got that from. And so in our uh, last example here, what we'll do is you're gonna see that we're, we're given a uh, equation to use for the atmospheric pressure. And once you see it, you're going to kind of understand um, in a sense, you know, where all this stuff came from here. And uh, we're actually going to just, you know, answer some questions on it, okay? But um, again, you see in general where the atmospheric pressure, um, you know, formula comes from, and we're just going to use that to, to measure. All right, so for our last example here, um, which is about atmospheric pressure, um, we see that the atmospheric pressure, if it's measured in pounds per square inch, um, is going to be, uh, pressure is equal to 14.7, 4, um, E raised to the negative uh, 0.1A, 0.21A rather. And if we go back to what we were looking at earlier, then notice here that this H represent height, and that could be the same as altitude. Okay, so if we have that, then that means that this minus mg divided by kt, all of that is what we are calling um, the negative 2.1, negative 0.21 here, okay? So that's where all that comes from. And this h you're, uh, is really just altitude. And um, of course, depending upon the units that we measure mass and all that stuff in, then uh, of course the pressure just ends up being in pounds per square inch. So with that being said, we kind of understand where this particular formula comes from in general. And um, we're assuming here that this 14.7 is going to be um, the atmospheric pressure from some reference point. And I'm, I'm going to assume that it is sea level, but it may not be. It just may be from you know where they were at <laughs> at the time when they made this up. Um, so here, if we have a, a city that has an atmospheric pressure of 11.59 pounds per square inch, what is the city's altitude in feet with respect to sea level? Yes, so here um, they're assuming that this 14.7 is going to be the pounds per square inch at sea level. Now, notice that we want the altitude in feet but altitude here or height as we say is measured in miles so we're going to have to make a conversion um, from miles to feet at the end of our calculations here okay 
So here we know that uh, pressure that we want, we know it's gotta be um, 11.59. So I'm just gonna uh, rewrite this here. 14.7 E raised to the minus 0.21 A. And here what this means is that the, the atmospheric pressure of the city is 11.59. And that equals 14.7 E raised to the negative 0.21 A. And what we want to find out is what A is. So if we do that, then the first thing that we want to do is divide both sides by this 14.7. So this would be 11.59 divided by 14.7. And this will equal E raised to the negative 0.21A. So after that, the next thing that we can do is we can take the natural log of both sides of this equation here. So if I do that, there will be natural log of 11.59 divided by 14.7 equals natural log of E raised to the negative to one a and this right hand side here uh, remember this is natural log of e raised to something which is same as log base e of e raised to something uh, all of this will just end up equaling just negative 0.21 a so here we have natural log of 11.59 divided by 14.7. All inside the logarithm is just equal to negative 0.21a. And then finally, a is just going to be the natural log of 11.59 again divided by 14.7. See if I can clean that up. Fourteen point seven, all that divided by negative point two one. Okay. And so if we put all that into our calculator here, then um, what we'll end up getting is going to be uh, one, I'm gonna just write it here, 1.13192 1 And notice that that's going to be in miles, okay? So since we have it in miles, what we want it in is in feet. So we're gonna to have to make that conversion here, okay? So to make this conversion, what we know, and I'm going to kind of do this like if I was in chemistry class, the conversion here, we know that one mile is the same as 5,280 feet. And here we know that the miles units reduce to one. And here we just take this 1.1319 number, multiply it times the 5,280 feet. And when we do that, we're going to get, of course, a number larger than 5,280. Uh, it's going to be 5,976.6 uh, feet. And that's approximately um, what it is. Okay. So now we see that um, the atmospheric pressure can also be modeled by exponential functions here. All right, so uh, this is the last example. So again, I know this was another long video, but I wanted to have all these examples in one place for you. Um, hopefully uh, this was helpful in, in not only exposing you to how we actually use exponential and logarithmic functions for things that affect our daily lives, 
but um, also gave you some tips on how to solve exponential and logarithmic equations whenever you're using them in applications. Uh, again, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Take care.